and let me check the recording. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to this second week of the Political Science 216 course on the 2020 presidential election public lecture series. My name is Joel Cassiola, and I am a member of the Political Science Department, and I am delighted to welcome you to this very important and unique uh, topic. This is the fifth time this course has been offered on presidential elections, and in a way it's sad that we have to have a topic on the pandemic virus. But I thought when creating the subject matter for this course that it didn't seem proper uh, to have a course while the virus is raging through our uh, society and already cost the lives of uh, 180,000 people to ignore this dominant uh, activity and development in our society. So here we are with, I think, uh, the strength of the San Francisco State faculty uh, really made visible. We have four experts on public health who will talk about different aspects of the virus. And I hope that you, along with me, will learn a lot uh, about the nature of the virus, the nature of our response, and perhaps about the future. So let me begin. Oh, oh, before I do that, the strength of this panel, which you will see soon, is owed to two uh, members of the faculty that I would like to personally thank. Uh, Professor Marty Martinson, uh, chair of the newly named Public Health Department, really worked with me to put this panel together. And um, my former colleague, uh, Dean uh, Amy Suiyoshi of the College of Ethnic Studies also assisted me greatly uh, in helping to put the panel together. So I want to thank both Amy and Marty for their assistance uh, in making this panel possible. Now turning to our first speaker, Dr. Emma Sanchez Vaznor is a social epidemiologist and professor in the Department of Public Health in the College of Health and Social Sciences at SF State. She serves as an affiliated faculty member at the Center for Health Equity at the University of California, San Francisco, and the Health Equity Institute at SFSU. Dr. Sanchez Vaznor research focuses on social inequalities in health and childhood obesity. She received her doctorate in social epidemiology from Harvard University. Please uh, welcome uh, Emma Sanchez Vaznor. Thank you, Dr. Casiola. I'm uh, very happy to be here today. And uh, I'm going to share my screen so I can get started. Uh, let's see. Okay, I uh, hope everybody can see that. Um, so I look forward to an interactive discussion. Um, there are a lot of things that we can say about COVID-19. Uh, my presentation today will focus on the epidemiology of COVID-19, specifically focusing on, on social factors. So um, first, I will briefly review some background about COVID-19, and then I will provide a summary um, about its uh, natural, natural history, which is basically the progression of the disease in humans over time. And then I'll talk about who is affected and where COVID is more prevalent, 
and some of the possible reasons about its unequal distribution uh, um, across people and places. So COVID-19, just to be clear, is a disease that is caused by the virus called the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS coronavirus 2. As we all know, uh, the virus spreads very easily from person to person through close contact, especially if that contact is prolonged, and if you are in crowds, indoors, and or in places that have uh, poor ventilation. Uh, the way in which the disease progresses over time is very important. And in my field, uh, which is epidemiology, we call this process the natural history of the disease, uh, which begins uh, once a person is infected with a virus. Uh, as you can see from this um, visual, uh, in stage one, the body begins to respond to the virus through the onset of symptoms. However, with COVID-19, there is a wide range of possibilities. For example, people can, can have zero symptoms and have the virus and um, the disease will never progress to stage two or stage three. While others can have symptoms like, sore, like a sore throat or cough or fever and progress to stage two or three or recover in either one of those uh, stages. In stage three, the virus uh, starts to replicate and to affect the body in various ways. Initially, the lungs were affected in many patients, but we now know that other parts of the body can be affected as well. Uh, for example, some people have had strokes and they thought that it was a stroke, but actually it was uh, an indication that they were infected with the virus. In stage three, the consequences can become more severe and they can include pneumonia, respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, and so on, all the way to death. So let's just put some numbers to the COVID story. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, the World Health Organization uh, calculated that there were about 25 million uh, cases of, co uh, of COVID-19 in uh, the world uh, with about 844,000 deaths. In the United States, uh, we have about, about 6 million cases and about 181,000 deaths. Uh, this is probably most likely, most likely an undercount and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So um, data is critically important uh, because we are talking about life and death, literally. Uh, so we need to know who is affected, where, why are some people more affected than others? Uh, and these, answering these questions can help us to reduce the spread of the disease as well as how to treat it or prevent it. Initially, we did not know uh, the answer to many of these questions. Uh, but more recently, we are starting to uh, get um, more information about this. Um, so emerging data uh, is now showing that there, there is a disproportionate impact across the population in terms of social factors, uh, which is what we call an epidemiology. And these social factors include age, race, ethnicity, uh, as well as uh, medical conditions that were existing before the pandemic, uh, and the um, places as well as the characteristics of those places. This is a very busy uh, slide. Um, the slide comes from, the data comes from the Centers for Disease Control, and uh, it shows hospitalizations and mortality data due to COVID-19. Uh, I just want us to focus on the uh, red rectangle and the um, yellow arrows. Uh, as you can see that as age increases, the risk of hospitalization and death also increases uh, with the worst um, uh, hospitalization rates. Uh, being, you know, 
uh, among the, those who are 75 and older. Although, um, okay, so this is a, a slide that shows uh, hospitalization rates and their disproportionate impact among African American, uh, American Indian and Latinos. Um, as you can see from the left side of the panel, uh, those groups have significantly higher hospitalization rates compared with the um, with uh, with white population. Uh, here we also see that um, uh, Asian or Pacific Islander populations have uh, slightly higher rates of hospitalization. Um, but uh, this is national data, and oftentimes national data can mask um, the disproportionate impact among uh, Asian Americans. So, for example, in California um, and some of the counties here in this table, uh, if you just see the, take a look at the um, yellow highlighted cells. Uh, we can see that although Asian Americans make up 12% of the positive cases in San Francisco, uh, they account for almost 50% of the deaths. Uh, the other thing to note is that um, there are persistent racial and ethnic disparities in um, hospitalization rates within every age group. And so as you can see in this slide, uh, that non-white groups for all age groups have higher rates of hospitalization. So uh, on the um, left-hand side, we see the age groups, 0 to 17, 18 to 49 years old, and then the rate of hospitalization. And so anything that you see above one means that um, that group is more likely to be hospitalized due to COVID. So uh, for here, for uh, American Indians, you see that the rates are much higher than one. Uh, for uh, non-Hispanic Blacks, the same thing, as well as for Latinos and Asians. But the worst disparities uh, are between um, African American and Latino populations. So uh, what this tells us is that age that the disparities persist even after you take into account the differences in age in these populations. So moving on to underlying conditions, the risk of hospitalization increases uh, if people have at least one underlying condition, uh, but it increases even more if people have uh, two or three or more conditions. Um, and for some conditions like chronic kidney disease and severe obesity, the risk increases even more. Um, and this is especially concerning since we have um, an obesity epidemic uh, right now going on in the United States, as can be seen in this uh, graph. So in the United States, as of 2017 and 18, uh, about half of the adults who were 20 years or older uh, were either obese or severely obese. COVID-19 cases are also distributed unequally across levels of geography, whether you can uh, Think of it in terms of county level or state and even uh, across countries. So as can be seen in this data by county, um, the darker red signals counties that are experiencing more cases. <coughs> and this uh, slide shows deaths by counties um, in the United States. So the, the situation is similar in terms of disparities across uh, counties. Um, and uh, the CDC provides data by state and they provide those as a percentage of the population. 
and you can still see differences between states as well. We also know that COVID-19 is patterned based on the characteristics of places. So for example, as shown in this graph, the infection rate is twice as high in the poorest zip codes compared with the most affluent zip codes, as can be seen on the left-hand side of the graph. Uh, similarly, uh, we see uh, patterns by race ethnicity. So um, infections, infection rates increase with increasing proportions of minorities. Uh, so for example, the, in, the infection rate here is five times higher in majority min, min, minority zip codes than in zip codes um, where the non-white population is less than 10%. This is another example of what I was talking about in the previous slide. And then in terms of countries, we see the differences across countries. And I don't have a picture for you, but um, uh, the Johns Hopkins University has a very nice uh, resource of information where you can compare different countries and their, uh, their curves. So one important question that um, that comes uh, that is revealed in this data is why is it that we see these racial and ethnic disparities in the impact of COVID-19? And so one of the prevalent explanations is that we have long-standing uh, root causes that we call inequalities uh, created by the societal structures. Uh, rather than by individuals um, that basically have sorted out Latinos and African Americans, for example, into the types of employment uh, that they hold. Uh, these groups uh, tend to be less likely to be able to work from home during sheltering place orders. And so uh, African Americans uh, are more likely to be, um, and Latinos are more likely to be uh, frontline workers. Uh, for example, they hold occupations in grocery stores and uh, food packing companies uh, or in delivery. Um, and so these occupations tend to have a higher and prolonged exposure to uh, people who might have COVID-19, even if they don't have any symptoms. Um, there's also some data that many of these um, uh, employment places uh, have different practices uh, and uh, to protect employee, employees, for example, differences in uh, protective equipment, um, as well as uh, testing and tracing and quarantining their employees. So um, the employment characteristics that I was just talking about also have some kind of intersection with housing characteristics. And so this also adds to the risk of um, exposure to COVID-19 and its impact. Uh, for example, uh, Latinos tend to live in larger households. And if they were infected at work and come home, uh, then the spread of the disease could be uh, even um, higher for those households. And then there are very widely documented inequalities in health. Um, the, these populations um, tend to be more likely to be diagnosed with diseases that are related to COVID-19, such as diabetes, heart disease, and lung disease. There's also less access to quality health care for these populations. So that increases uh, the risks that are, are, are already there. In epidemiology, we call this uh, 
place effects to things that are to attributes that have to do with places, not people. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, we see variations in, in, in the impact of COVID across counties, zip codes, and uh, states. Um, and so, one of the explanations for this is that uh, there's a difference in the policies that are being implemented, um, as well as the changes in those policies over time. As you can see here, um, we see the effects of shel uh, the shelter in place policy in the pattern of COVID-19 cases in San Francisco. Um, and uh, also compliance with the policies uh, that is very likely to vary across place. And then finally that um, the uh, politicization, politicization of, of COVID-19. Okay, I'm almost done here and I just want to talk about a couple of challenges. Um, there are at least three, but I'm sure many more. Um, the first is how to protect the health and life of the population, as well as the health of the economy. And so there's a very main, you know, major question that we see in the media and in the research world about how to strike a, strike a balance between the two and whether that is even possible given what we need to do in order to contain the virus and the spread. We also have many knowledge gaps. Um, uh, there is some good data coming out, but um, we are um, refining the data as it comes. And um, the uh, uh, rates that we see, for example, for the death rate, uh, we know that it, that's probably most likely an, un, an undercount. Uh, the New York Times uh, just did an analysis where they found more deaths than we would expect. Uh, so the conclusion is that deaths due to 19 um, are, are under, undercounted. And then finally, of course, there is hope and that's you all probably know um, there are a number of efforts in clinical trials and so on uh, that are trying to find um, both effective treatments as well as vaccines. And I'm going to end there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. It was uh, very clear to see uh, uh, the interesting data, which we may have seen in part uh, through the media, but it's great to have it all together uh, in one presentation. So I appreciate that very much. <clears throat> Our second speaker uh, this afternoon is, is Professor Laura Mamo, who is Professor of Public Health at San Francisco State. Uh, Dr. Mamo received her PhD in Medical Sociology from the University of California at San Francisco. She is a sociologist of science, technology, and medicine, whose research examines the gendered and sexual dimensions of medical technology and practice, and its intersection with the social and cultural dimensions of health and health equity. She is interested in issues of justice in science, medicine, and healthcare, and most recently was awarded a National Science Foundation grant to study the equity politics of cervical cancer prevention technologies. Thank you, uh, and I should have said thank you to Emma for uh, her presentation, and now I want to introduce uh, Dr. Mamo and thank her for her appearing on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Dr. Casiola. Thank you, Emma. I um, put my slide up a little bit early, so I um, right. apologize for that, but I hope you all can see the slides. 
I am going to take a slightly different uh, approach because as Dr. Cassiola mentioned, I study the cultural and social aspects of health and illness as a public health scholar. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things I've been thinking about in this brew, if you will, of COVID-19, of presidential politics, and of the um, movements for Black Lives. So I've been thinking a lot about the politics of knowledge, about truth and truths, about trust and trustworthiness, and about the ways knowledge can be manipulated for certain purposes. That is the ways knowledge can be politicized. Knowledge for social scientists and for many of us is always understood as situated. It depends on who you are and where you sit and it is contingent. It changes based on our context. But knowledge has become a domain of contention in particularly unique ways in the past few years. Experts and expertise are often viewed with suspicion. I've especially been thinking about George Floyd's murder and the concept of gaslighting. There was an article written by a group of physicians and published in the journal A Scientific American called Structural Gaslighting. In this article, the physician spoke of George Floyd's autopsy, the first of three autopsies. On May 29th, an autopsy report was released and the country was told that in this autopsy report, it was revealed that George Floyd had no physical, there were no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxiation. No physical findings that support trauma caused his death, the report said. It went on to say what was found was potential intoxicants and a pre existing cardiovascular disease that likely in quotes, likely contributed to his death. This was then later found to be misinformation and it was not benign misinformation. What the report did was misattribute the real social cause of death. The police violence and trauma was attributed instead to a biological cause something about George Floyd's body and health. In the next few days, two independent examinations would invalidate this autopsy. And by extension, these two independent examinations would invalidate the role of this autopsy in undermining the police officers and policing as what is really to blame in Floyd's murder. So these physicians, a collective group of physicians, a group of experts were writing to refuse the expertise of the first autopsy report and to call out the structures of medical expertise that allowed this report to come to be. And I quote them, we will not be complicit in the ongoing manipulation of medical expertise to erase government sanctioned violence. So what happened here start me, started me thinking. For days, black Americans sat and still sit with the all too familiar pain of being told that the truth is not true. Of fearing that the law would believe an expert report over the reality that they saw, that we saw with our own eyes, and that many have lived with their own lives. As the authors wrote, it's a miscarriage of justice that deepens the cut. Not only can Black people be killed with impunity, a physician's autopsy report can be twisted 
to replace the truth, the truth that we all saw. So we were all gaslighted here. We were told that what we saw, that what we knew to be true was not true. So this is a difficult story, but it's an important one. And it's part of the stew that I think we've all been in in these past times. It informs what is happening and has been happening. And it also helps us to think about the presidential election. There is a lot of structural gaslighting going on. And so what is gaslighting? Gaslighting by definition is the attribution of cause or blame for something to something else. So to attribute cause to something that it is not. To make people question what they know, what they saw with their own eyes. And to make people think they're crazy. And I don't know about you, but I've been feeling pretty crazy lately. Gaslighting can be political. It is political. It's purposeful. Of course, truth does exist and facts do matter. And data matters as our colleague just pointed out. And one truth that exists is that in the US, 180,000 people have died due to a virus. This is not their fault, nor the fault of their biologies or pre-existing conditions as we learned in the last slide. It is quite complex and due to multiple factors. But when we are told it is our fault for being old or poor or black, we are being gaslighted in a particular way. We are being structurally gaslighted as the physicians in the American scientists let us know. And we wonder what can we trust and what is trustworthy information. And it made me think about this again at the Democratic Convention, which many of you may have watched, when Kristen Irkiza spoke of her father's death from COVID-19. An active young man, an adult in mid to late age, um, who had died recently. And when Urquiza gave her powerful speech, she stated his only pre-existing condition was trusting the president. In other words, her father was gaslighted too when he was told that wearing a mask would not prevent the disease, or perhaps that he was not at risk, or perhaps that it was a hoax or perhaps it would go away or something else. But he was not told the truth. So in public health, when attribution of death is blamed on something else, we refer to this as missing or misattributing the root causes of disease. And we heard this in the last talk as well, a mention of the real root causes of disease. What we know as public health professionals is that the root causes are driven by the social and structural determinants of health. And in public health, there has been powerful and pervasive knowledge showing this truth. The truth that in fact health and disease is driven not solely by biology, but is driven by the social and structural ways in which we organize social life. I share this table with you. It is a usual table of the uh, root causes of disease with each column attributing what we know to cause both good and poor health. This is not new information. We have always known this information and it has been measured, validated, and reproduced over time. The more money one has, the more education, the more equality they are given, the more rights they are granted, the less discrimination, 
the less violence and the less denial of one's humanity, the more health they have. The longer they live, the better they live. So when we were gaslighted by George Floyd's first autopsy, the claims made by experts in power were made to deny this truth and instead to blame the possibility that he may have had an underlying condition, taking our eyes away and misattributing the real cause of George Floyd's murder. And I know that's a lot. And I take us back to COVID-19 again, and to San Francisco data that also was shared in the prior presentation. We know in San Francisco that the cases, just the positive cases of COVID-19 are 51% and most prevalent in Latinx communities not because of their bodies, but because of the ways our social life is organized, because of our occupations, because of the work we do, because of where we live and the homes we live in. So even when we have the truth and we know the facts, and we know like Professor Emma Sanchez showed us that the impact of COVID-19 is disproportionate, this deluge of data documenting inequality in disease and death is not new. The continual documentation can be helpful. We need data, we need truth, we need facts. But as one of my friends and colleagues, Ruha Benjamin says, the facts alone will not save us. And even when we know the loss, as many of you might know firsthand, we still question the cause, the attribution, we're still left wondering, why are we left wondering? What is happening? So what does this have to do with the presidential election? There's a lot of gaslighting going on. There's a rise of conspiracy and other falsehoods. There's a co-optation of social movements for health rights and justice. And as I said earlier, when I began, that experts and expertise are questioned in a different way. Some of it is needed and necessary, and I don't think we need to go back to a time where we accept the truth of experts without questioning, it, questioning that. What we need to do is some questioning. And I share this image with you, and perhaps you've seen it yourself. Um, it's an image we see at many uh, pro-Trump rallies. And in some ways, this image is making me feel crazy. It may be making you feel crazy. Here are people co-opting a social movement for health and rights to reproductive care into a lie that mask wearing is an affront on individual liberty instead of a proven and known and well-documented public health approach to prevent disease and save lives. So returning to the truth, the facts alone, even when we have them, these facts may not save us. We must see through this misinformation and we must participate. So when it comes to the presidential election, there may be two choices, but the real choice is how to participate, to participate in knowledge production and circulation without romanticizing a time when we were differential to the truth of professional experts, nor allowing oneself to be part of a mobilization of falsehood. How do we fight expertise with expertise? And we have examples of fighting expertise with expertise. I won't read each one, but in our history, we can stand on the shoulders of giants. The Black Panther Party fought um, for food justice with expertise, the women's health movement created knowledge of our bodies to fight the misinformation and lack of knowledge of women's bodies, and AIDS activists challenged discrimination and stigma by using science, by becoming scientists, so that they could fight to move 
and fast track drugs that were needed to the market. And there are social movements now, and this is a way of participating. I, I give a few examples of social organizations and movements um, that are being called forward to fight expertise with expertise. So, I, so as I end, I will return to the two choices of presidential politics and ask you to think about your participation. You, the public, we, the people, get to decide who and what counts in society. What is truth and what is trustworthy and who will govern us going forward? The current administration and conservative followers, I believe, support gaslighting, obfuscation, confusion, misattribution, and misinformation, particularly of the cause and means of preventing COVID-19. They deny science, expertise, social movements, democracy, and participation. These are the facts. The coronavirus in the US has 181,000 deaths. These deaths are preventable deaths with good information, with the right knowledge. These could have been prevented. So we must remember that a virus may have infected the body, but that our exposure to that virus has a social cause, a root cause, and it is the structures of society. When we speak of government, we are speaking of how our government intervenes in and shapes the structures of society that make us vulnerable and protect us from health and illness. I know you'll be covering the policies of both candidates in this semester. I provide a few from the Biden-Harris campaign because they are offering a plan to prevent, treat, and end the pandemic. They are offering a plan to support and expand public health and public health care. They are offering a plan to support families. I provide a few other examples of how they're going to do so in terms of supporting families with better pay, with relieving debt, supporting families with health care policies um, for health. They're uh, looking at climate change. They're looking at the green economy. They're expanding community health centers and Medicaid coverage. And they're investing in public education. These are part of their platform. So I had to end a little partisan, sorry, but the way forward toward knowledge, toward health equity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura, for that uh, very uh, interesting and certainly incisive um, presentation. We will now move to our third speaker, Professor J. Yu, Grace J. Yu, who is a professor and former chair of the Asian American Studies Department. She is currently the first year experience faculty director. Uh, professor Yu has a master's degree in public health from Loma Linda University and a PhD in sociology from the University of California at San Francisco. For two decades, she has led research projects focused on social support and health among women of color, immigrant communities, and Asian Americans. During the pandemic, Professor Yu has been a volunteer with the Pacifica Beach Coalition, an anti-sewing squad. Professor Yu, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Joel, and thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, I want to say my talk is a bit different. Uh, it's a bit my own about a bit about my own journey during shelter in place, um, my own way of coping, and my own response to the pandemic. Um, 
at the beginning of shelter in place, I must say for all of us, uh, we were experiencing panic and shortages of all kinds. Um, toilet paper across the United States, in my community, it was milk. Um, a common sight to be seen that we saw were families um, over preparing, maybe even hoarding. Um, and at the same time, our government was, had created massive confusion about facial coverings early in this pandemic. So early, early in this pandemic, um, early in this pandemic, um, I knew I couldn't re really rely on what was occurring in the United States. I couldn't really find uh, the necessary information I needed to protect myself here in the United States. I realized I needed to look elsewhere and I started to Zoom with my cousins in South Korea where they had seen a containment in cases um, and uh, a decree decrease in COVID cases overall. So I was starting to Zoom with my cousin in, in Korea. And my cousin in Korea said the key to their society um, functioning at that time, you know, folks were going to restaurants, they were going to movie theaters. She said the key was, were masks. Wearing masks was key to South Korea functioning. Um, but here in the United States, I was receiving so much confusion from my president. Uh, this is an April 3rd White House briefing from my president. He states with a mask, it's going to be really a voluntary thing. You can do it, you don't have to do it. I'm choosing not to do it, but some people may want to do it and that's okay. As I greet presidents, prime, minister, prime ministers, dictators, kings, queens, I don't see it for myself, I just don't. And then later we see in a July 12th briefing, um, a different, different take. He states, we're asking everybody that when you're not able to socially distance, wear a mask, get a mask. Whether you like the mask or not, they have an impact. They'll have an effect and we need everything we can get. I will use it gladly. Anything that potentially can help is a good thing. So fascinating, this is so interesting. From April 3rd, we have the statement from our president. And then on July 12th, we have a different kind of statement. And so this, I believe create, had created so much confusion. There was also confusion from the CDC. Um, this is the US Surgeon General on February 29th and his twit, twit, Twitter, um, he, he, he tweets, they are not effective in preventing gen the general public from catching coronavirus. But if a healthcare provider can't get them to care for such sick patients, it puts them and our communities at risk. And so um, again, the early onset of uh, CDC, um, stating and confusing people about not, uh, not recommending the use of face masks. And so I'm just giving you a timeline here. This is a timeline of here in the United States. Uh, in February 20, on February 26, 2020, the, the Centers for Disease Control raises concerns about COVID-19, um, about community spread after women in Solano County, County becomes diagnosed um, despite no prior travel history. And then on February 27th, 2020, Vice President Pence states that the spread of uh, co coronavirus is low. And then February 28th, we have our president state call the coronavirus a Democrat's new hoax. This is February 28th. Um, and then on February 27th in 2020, CDC issues a statement about not recommending the use of face masks to help prevent COVID-19. Um, and then, of course, the U.S. Surgeon General tweets, surgery people stop buying masks. This is February 29th, 2020. And then we see on April 3rd, 2020, the CDC reverses its early recommendations on masks and now recommends the use of face coverings uh, when around others. Um, and later we start to see various cities um, also having various ma mask mandates. We see on April 8th, 8th, 2020, in Los Angeles, the mayor um, orders employees and customers of uh, various establishments to start wearing masks. Um, I want to talk about mask mandates across the world. Um, you know, I really started to look um, outside the United States uh, in terms of, you know, what people were doing. And in Taiwan, um, you know, they were, they had masks available as early as February 6th, but they um, ordered a nationwide mask rationing system. So only folks could, could get like two masks per week. Um, and they mandated masks uh, April 1st for public transportation, public transportation 
In South Korea, mask uh, make, wearing was highly encouraged as early as January 12th, 20th, uh, January 20th, 2020. Um, and then April 13, it was compulsory when leaving the house. In fact, you were fined if you didn't. Um, and in the Philippines, uh, they started to require masks as well uh, as on April 2nd. Um, I'm sorry, let's, let me go to um, my next slide. Uh, as well in Spain, early April, um, mask uh, a mandate was also, um, also part of, um, was also compulsory. Now I have this picture, um, this was tape taken on April 28th, 2020. And I, this is Vice President Mike Pence, who is visiting COVID-19 survivors. And I just, you know, I, I think the picture says it all. Um, you know, our leadership at the, that moment in time was not wearing a mask. Um, and this is April 28th, 2020. And um, those around him obviously are wearing a mask, but he is not wearing a mask. Now we see in terms of Republican and Democrats, this is a, a study by the Pew Research Center. We do see some differences, but we also see, you know, increasing use of, of wearing masks uh, from June 2020 to August 2020. We see that there's an increase um, among Republicans. Um, we've seen that increase. And then Democrats, obviously, there are more, there's a large, larger, there's a larger percentage of folks wearing masks. And so there's definitely differences between Republicans and Democrats in terms of mask usage. And Obviously, I think everyone saw this picture at the, at the, uh, of the Republican National Convention. And, you know, again, the picture speaks for itself. Um, you know, you could probably look at all the folks um, in this picture and you see, you know, like a sea of people, but maybe one or two people wearing a mask. So, um, which is, again, and, and, and really kind of close together, not necessarily socially distancing. Um, but again, this, this picture kind of says it all. Um, at the same time, um, you know, um, we've also seen anti-mask protests throughout the United States. And uh, this one just occurred like last week in Costa Mesa. Um, and we've been seeing this throughout the United States, very, various anti-mask protests. And the theme throughout these pro protests is defending one's personal freedoms. This is like the common theme about in terms of these anti-mask protests. Now. Um, I'm going to introduce you to this term of craft activism, um, and um, and I, I want to say that um, I, I I am a craft activist. Uh, Ten days into the shelter in place, I decided my I attempt my uh, attempt shopping for the very first time, and I wore a mask uh, mask at the store, and I entered the store, and half of the shoppers were wearing a mask. Um, however, the folks that were working at the cash register had no mask, and at that time there were no glass kind of, um, there was no, no covering. Um, they were literally at the cash register without a mask, you know, um, helping all the various customers come through the store. Um, and I had asked the manager, manager if they, they could get masks, but he had said they could not get masks. It was so difficult to get a mask in mid to late March. Um, and um, on social media, I was also horrified. I had former students that were healthcare workers that were petrified going to work because they, there was no PPE and they were, they were kind of freaking out on social media. And I was really, really concerned about them. Um, no one was protecting them. Um, and so this was about spring break. Spring break, I think is third week of March for us this, this last year. And I then made it my goal to uh, start sewing. Um, and um, I've never sewed before in my life. I don't have a sewing machine, but the wonders of social media by simply announcing on social media that I wanted to sew and I wanted, I needed a sewing machine. Um, I literally within 24 hours had someone that was willing to teach me to sew, which was my colleague, Professor, actually Valerie Sew, her name's Sew, Professor, Professor Valerie Sew, who taught me how to sew over Zoom. And my other colleague, Professor Kira Donald, who just gave me her sewing machine to sew and also a bed sheet to sew with. And so I started sewing uh, literally the week of spring break and I made my first tin mask with a bed sheet uh, and the elastic around the bed sheet. Because the other crazy thing uh, during this time period, it was really difficult to find elastic and fabric. 
Um, I literally, at Amazon, it said elastic would arrive in May and fabric would arrive in May. And so um, again, the wonders of Facebook, um, I kind of like reached out to my friends and I said, I want to continue making masks for grocery store workers and healthcare workers, but I don't have any elastic. Um, you know, elastic is like the new toilet paper. Can anyone help me out? And so again, my wonderful, the wonders of social media, my cousin in South Korea mails me like literally elastic and fabric and gets me started. Um, and later I also joined a group called the Anti-Sewing Squad who also is, then is able to supply me fabric and elastic. And elastic, let me tell you, between March and April, elastic was gold. It was so hard to find elastic. I literally was breaking it from my clothes, clothes, old, older, like older pieces of um, dresses, like dresses, shirts. I was just taking it and using it to make masks. Um, so anyways, my sewing adventure began during spring break. I was sewing for healthcare workers without PPE, healthcare workers who didn't have PPE, farm workers, low-income elderly living in assisted living facilities, low-income elderly that lived in nursing homes, um, and muni bus drivers. Um, it turned, to be, turned out to be my way of coping. Um, and um, everyone has different ways. This is myself. I, made, I was making masks for grocery store workers in my neighborhood. And this, these are kind of my first masks. They didn't have masks, and I started making them and distributing them. Um, and again, I think everyone, ever, all of us have been coping during the pandemic in various, various different ways. And unfortunately for me, I cannot watch Netflix. I tend to over-identify with fictitious characters and it's not really good for me. And so um, sewing became my way of coping. Um, my, my became, and it continually um, serves to be my coping resource during this time period. Um, so as a faculty member, I was also starting to think about limited opportunities in the summer for students. Um, and I was starting to think, my, my grand vision was to get students sewing this summer. Uh, because I knew there were limited opportunities. And so this summer, I got a crew of folks sewing uh, with, with, with me. By the way, these are the masks we've made. We've made over a thousand masks. Um, and it's part of our craft activism um, that we've done. And um, we've relied on donations of people donating or letting us borrow sewing machines. Um, also, like I've mentioned, my cousin sending initially elastic and fabric from South Korea, but then people like throughout the, my network also giving me everything they had in their closets as they were cleaning, you know, they had thread they were finding, they were finding cloth. And so our initial mass were um, made with, with donations and, and, and then sewing machines uh, that were provided by um, family and friends. And um, later we all joined the anti-sewing squad um, and um, these are my students that were sewing. And again, between all of us, we sewed a thousand masks. Um, and um, again, these are some of our masks. Um, and they were sent to San Quentin, farm workers, um, and various low income communities throughout the United States. Now, I want to just, I, I'm going to end here, but I want to just kind of encourage all of you if there, if there are ways for you to engage. And um, I want to let you know there are several different initiatives here at SF State. One is actually a group of, um, Aspire is leading a, uh, a group on coping with COVID-19. If you've been impacted by COVID-19 personally, or you have a family member that's been impacted and you would like other students just to kind of support you through this. Um, Aspire um, uh, has led, is leading a student group on this. So I encourage you, this is a bit.ly on this, uh, to take this information. I will share it with um, your professor as well, so he can also kind of remind you that this exists. And this will start September 22nd. They're just meeting one hour every week for six weeks on Zoom. So um, this could be a, a great support for you, especially if you've been impacted by COVID-19. The other thing I want to make mention, it's never too late to sew a face covering because we still are in the pandemic uh, and now we have the fires and I'm leading a group of students in terms of sewing every Thursday night, seven to eight, and we're going to start next um, Thursday again. So if you'd like to join, this is the information. It's a great group of students. Um, in fact, some of the students want to start a sewing club here at State. 
um, but it's a great group of group a great group of students to to learn sewing from and also to socialize because I know during this time period that it's really hard for a lot of students to interact with one another and so this is such a great space we're going to be sewing and socializing so I encourage you to join again I'll send this information to your professor thank you thank you very much professor you um, professor you has to um, uh, leave quickly so I will look for a couple of questions if you have a question for professor you we can use this time um, one question um, Dr. Yu, why not a face shield better being wider as a question? Well, I think folks are using a face shield, but the mask, because it's, cl it's closer to your face, offers better protection. The face shield, if you're right here, right, there's still kind of uh, dispersion of sort of air droplets that could still occur. So the face mask, because it's covered, is actually, more efficacious. By, by the way, there are several scientific studies on, on the efficaciousness of face masks um, and so versus like shields and they've shown that face facial masks are actually much more efficacious. So, Another question is uh, uh, why are you emphasizing the mask but not hand gloves? Why am I emphasizing the mask and not hand gloves? Um, well, mass is because that is sort of where the spread is. is it, it's, it's through sort of droplets, right? When we speak, right? It's like this, all the, the air that comes out, that's where the transmission is. Um, gloves, um, you know, that's where the hand washing comes in. Uh, and so, um, I mean, folks may still use gloves. I know at the very beginning I was using gloves, but now I've really resorted to hand washing. Um, yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, why not recommend washing the face too, which is the main entry of the virus? Sure, um, but I would still say wear a mask. <laughs> wear a mask okay. and after you're out, wash your face. All I, right. I think so wearing you should, a mask is just crucial at this point, you know? Right. You should do both. Yes, you should do both. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yu. We really appreciate your photos of the masks were quite beautiful. In addition uh, to being functional, uh, the aesthetic value was really surprising. Uh, the variability of the materials, and they really show the, the kind of, uh, of contributions you got of material so that the masks are very attractive in addition to, uh, to being functional. Well, that's fantastic. If anyone needs a mask, you don't have access, you are always welcome. I will mail you one. You could put right. your email in the chat um, okay. and then I will get back to you all. But we have, you know, nine SF State students that were selling this summer. And so we made Terrific. a thousand masks. And so we're still and selling those, this fall. And those students deserve to be commended as well. And oh. so please pass along the thanks of, of everyone who's, uh, uh, viewing this uh, video, I hope I can speak for them in congratulating the students for making that great effort as a group uh, mm -hmm. and making a contribution to society in a really important way. Yeah, I, I, I know it made a difference for them. Um, great. As, and, but if okay. you, anyone wants to learn to sew, uh, next Thursday, 7 o'clock. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Bye. And, all right. So long. Grace, and now for our fourth and final speaker, uh, Professor David Rebinal, who is Assistant Professor of Public Health in the College of Health and Social Sciences. Dr. Rebinal conducts epidemiological research and mixed methods evaluations with a focus on informing interventions that can address the social and political determinants of racial health inequities. His current research examines the roles of neighborhood features, immigrant political participation, and neighborhood social capital on the mental health of Asian Americans. Dr. Rebinal has 
nearly two decades of public health experience, including working at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. He holds a Doctor of Public Health degree with a focus on social epidemiology and community development from UC Berkeley School of Health. Dr. Rebinal. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Castillo, uh, for inviting me uh, to be here with you all. And thanks to all of you on the on the uh, call listening in. If anyone's listening in on, the, on this uh, call who works on the front lines, I, I just wanted to first say thank you uh, for your uh, service and your valuable uh, response. You know, if you're an essential worker, et cetera, uh, you know, all those working to respond to this pandemic, uh, risking your lives uh, to, to, to make our communities healthier should be commended. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to wrap up I think some really thoughtful uh, presentations uh, and talk about what's next. So I entitled this presentation, um, Pandemics, Public Health and the Presidential Election 2020, Moving Forward Towards Health and, and Equity. Um, and so, you know, today, September 1st, you heard the epidemiology from, from Emma uh, and, you know, we really are at an inflection point um, uh, here on this pandemic. Um, and really in this country, right, with this, with this uh, coming election, we're 63 days away from the election. Uh, today marks around month six or so, or approaching month six from our um, stay at home orders here in California. Now we have some welcome news that, uh, you know, rates of infections and deaths may be plateauing, uh, but they're certainly still relatively high. And it re reminder that it only took us one month um, from a case count of 5 million on August 9th to now 6 million today. And so uh, we're going to be dealing with this for quite some time. Uh, and so this crisis uh, really has reminded us how unprepared the world is uh, to detect and respond to emerging infectious diseases. And so what I hope to talk about is what we can do about it, what investments we can make uh, now that can help us navigate and prepare uh, both from making, you know, from, um, you know, what would make, what make things worse, but also for future pandemics. Uh, the other thing that we know and we've heard clearly from the other speakers uh, is that this pandemic has exposed and, and has worsened profound inequities in our U.S. healthcare and public health systems um, that trickled down in our communities. And so that we know that uh, communities of color and low-income populations are at greater risk uh, of the infection and mortality and also the social consequences uh, sort of of these dis disparities. And so what I wanted to do was just give an overview of some public health recommendations moving forward and discuss those in consideration uh, for the two candidates. Uh, um, and so I'll focus really on the presidential uh, candidates because of the you know, series focus. Um, and before I get into some of those recommendations, I want to take an opportunity to situate this public health conversation uh, with two, uh, you know, two sort of definitional things, two contextual things. One is what, what is public health? And I think we've been using public health, uh, assuming everyone understands what it is. Uh, and so the Institute of Medicine really defines it as what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which, and I add the word, all people can be healthy or achieve optimal health. Uh, and so you know, I'm, the public health endeavor is, you know, can, you know, is made up of you know, government, you know, private industry, uh, you know, community members, community organizations, um, other sectors, right? And so this this sort of web of uh, you know, sectors and organizations sort of depicts that. And we have graduates from our program that work in all these sectors. But I really wanna concentrate my remarks on our, on our public health system, our public health agencies, of which you know, who is responsible for assuring the health and safety and wellness of all people right, in its jurisdictions and in, at the federal level, all people who live in this country and not just paying customers, not just subscribers. 
right? And so public health is what we do as a society to collect what we do that. And the public health agency sort of sets guidelines and policies and enforces them, enforces them, uh, you know, um, at, the, at the federal level, which gets down to the local levels. The other aspect is that public health has indeed been preparing for this pandemic. Uh, and I didn't have to go very far back, uh, but I just wanted to take a stab and, and, and just show and remind folks. And certainly when I worked at the CDC, you know, in 2002 to 2006, much of the focus of my training in field epidemiology was in disaster preparedness and bioterrorism preparedness because it had just been after 9-11. And so we saw in the Bush, the second Bush administration, lots of emphasis on preparing for pandemics and preparedness. Uh, we see uh, in Obama responding to uh, um, you know, the Ebola outbreak. Uh, there was avian flu, SARS, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of Zika virus uh, uh, not too long ago. And so right, we have editorials, we have uh, briefings to say that it's not if, but when, but yet here we are, right? And so I say those two pieces to keep in mind as I sort of go through what, some, what I and some other public health um, experts are recommending whoever wins this next election uh, take on. Uh, and as participants in, the next, in this process, I hope you would consider some of these recommendations as you choose which candidates' uh, values and policies uh, they put forth. So the first recommendation I wanted to do um, is really to, is to come back to scientific leadership, and that is to restore the authority uh, that the CDC had. So we have an infrastructure that that can deal with this, that has dealt with similar, um, you know, similar uh, crises, um, certainly not at the, the scale uh, any time recently, but there are experts, right? And so we've, we, 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 can, we may have heard, you may have heard, uh, but there was certainly uh, um, a, a tension uh, between uh, the science community Right, and the executive authorities or the politicians, if you will, who were uh, in, uh, taking the uh, messaging these recommendations, right? Uh, and for example, we saw you know recommendations being shelved or, or downright ignored, uh, and we saw you know leadership disinvited from the table uh, and certainly briefings. And so um, I think uh, Professor Mamo's. Um, uh, talk about truth, trustworthiness, uh, and expertise really should you know be at the forefront of whoever uh, a takes the next uh, term in office, but b also what we demand of our uh, executive, uh, our president, who's in charge of the executive branch, and that is, will they let scientific or and public health experts really ask, is this, is there evidence for this, is this true, and not am I going to be reprimanded for saying this, which I think has been the tenor a lot uh, by many uh, public health leaders uh, in, uh, the, at the federal level. Uh, we, we, we've heard from the other speakers about this sort of crisis in communication. Uh, and uh, at the federal level, uh, it's, been, it's been at minimum a crisis. Uh, the, the public messaging and inconsistencies and the messengers have been, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, you know, embarrassing. Uh, and so immediately whoever takes office should uh, inform the public daily. Uh, I, when, the, when the pandemic was thought to be getting better in California, I did uh, fly uh, to my, visit my uh, parents in New York and, uh, you know, quarantined there for 14 days and pretty much stayed uh, put there, but you saw local officials on TV every day briefing the public. Uh, we saw here at the federal level uh, briefing stop for almost a three month hiatus. And even those who were giving the briefings were not from the scientific community. Uh, many people will probably recognize the person on the left of my screen is Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, one of our leading national uh, experts in infectious diseases. But maybe some of you won't recognize who the person on the right is and he's the director of the Centers for Disease Control, Robert Redfield. Uh, uh, and that's because some of these folks were removed, right, from these briefings. Um, 
And so I would expect and, and, and see and ask what, what we demand again of our uh, leaders in terms of how we inform the public. Um, this part about testing you know, also another debacle, right? Um, and of course it's understood that uh, when you're in the first throes of, of, of a crisis, a pandemic, you sort of making do. It's almost like for those of us at teaching, we had to sort of figure out what to do in the meantime before we can plan for a, this, this fall semester. Well, the, the recommendations for testing have also been, you know, inconsistent. Uh, and with, with a health equity uh, idea in mind, you know, we really should be targeted testing, meaning uh, we heard where the most risk and burden is, and that is in communities of color uh, in low-income communities. Uh, we saw early on in the crisis that um, it, there was no coordination of where to deploy these limited resources. Uh, and so sometimes you had people who had means or who were celebrities or, or, or athletes who getting test, tested daily. Meanwhile, communities where we know uh, were um, suffering the most and at risk the most, having limited access to, to important testing. You know, and from a public health perspective, one of the first things we want to do during an epidemic, let alone a pandemic, is to have a good sample about where, where the risk is happening and where to then, you know, tailored resources. Uh, and so, uh, although, you know, a targeted, and, and tar by the way, targeted testing should then inform, you know, um, where to message, uh, contact tracing, et cetera, et cetera, right? All the different tools we know we need to do uh, to fight a, a public health crisis such as this. Uh, and so uh, the, the testing program uh, has been, um, you know, a mess, a, a debacle. Uh, and I know that uh, the Biden-Harris uh, uh, plan that, that I looked up uh, for this, their plan is, is definitely much more, um, uh, organized, uh, starting with uh, investments in an infrastructure, uh, building up a public health jobs core that would uh, let folks uh, be in these communities where we, we can uh, administer these tests and then invest in you know the testing labs themselves to turn them around much quicker. Uh, and this should be done in, in as we ramp up a universal testing program. Okay, uh, a few more points. Uh, we should be having a federal dashboard with live data. Um, and I know we also heard from um, um, our speakers about the importance of data. But early on in the, uh, the pandemic, it was universities, I think it was Johns Hopkins who developed the live dashboard that both uh, local health officials uh, and the media used to sort of track the virus. Uh, and we're still not at a place where the public can access data in a timely fashion. Uh, and that's, that's, um, that, that holds back the ability of a robust coordinated public health response. And so uh, a paper was written by these uh, advocates and organizations who are uh, um, you know, at the federal level uh, urging investments in, um, uh, in, in building a, an infrastructure that can track this. Uh, in, in that report, it includes better indicators uh, of, that include things like um, the number of healthcare workers who have gotten infected, um, the number of patients who've been isolated uh, with three days of symptom onset, the proportion of cases arising even among, among quarantine contacts. contacts. Uh, and so we need more granular epidemiology. And right now we have a very piecemeal uh, um, network of information that I know public health uh, folks are, uh, are, are working on, but again, it has been uh, held back uh, by a, an administration uh, who, um, you know, who, do, who do values sort of data and science. And, and it's just simply not acceptable. Um, funny how uh, this particular uh, cons the, um, issue of, of face covering and masks, you know, is a perfect lesson that, uh, and Dr. Gray, uh, Dr. you covered it well, where um, we had a crisis in communication. Uh, and uh, 
the first and foremost thing we, we want to emphasize in, in this response was distance, physical distancing, which we, we term social distancing. Uh, but there absolutely was um, uh, a back and forth about whether a face covering or mask should be implemented. And we do see growing evidence that it is, it basically works in this way. It one uh, uh, protects you from it, in, um, part of, um, inhaling or uh, having uh, airborne uh, particle viruses into you, but it also protects others around you, right? And so it's the distancing with face coverings, right? That can be effective. Uh, and this is a, a completely uh, perfect situation where we need uh, experts from communities, um, you know, uh, ec leaders in communities like faith-based communities, uh, people on the ground who can help talk about uh, the different cultural and uh, different um, fears, if you will, that came early around the masks. Um, and so uh, the Biden-Harris uh, campaign has uh, language about a mandate around face coverings. And let me just say that the face coverings are almost like a great, a good duty, right, for each other, right? Because it helps protect you and it helps your family, but also protects those around you. And so uh, in the absence of solid evidence, I think it was a great, almost a perfect case study in how leadership can support and uh, support the collection of whether or not recommendations like this are effective. Uh, and it just took time. Okay, I'm almost, uh, almost done. Uh, and I know that uh, this is something that government likes to do is they like to convene expert panels and, uh, you know, uh, groups to help advise. But in this, in this instance, I think it's almost imperative that we, we just bring in new, a new panel of responses. And, I, and here's what I would urge that panel to do. Uh, we need to have a, a, a round table of, of experts in public health and medicine, um, in communications that a prioritize a scientific understanding that wishful thinking. Uh, and I don't have time to sort of go through the various uh, examples of just the, um, the current administration talking about what they think or wish is going to happen, you know, by faith alone. Uh, and it was just simply unacceptable. Um, we knew from pandemic, prior pandemics, the stigma placed upon certain communities uh, that impacts them uh, um, economically, but also stigmatizes them and reinforces certain stereotypes. Uh, and but we also know that um, the recommendations like to get tested, uh, to wear masks also have uh, racial and um, ethnic, um, uh, you know, uh, are affected by uh, ethnic and racial um, cultural beliefs, right? And so we should know by now what happens to certain communities in an infectious disease outbreak. And we should then have such a, a response team that is solely dedicated to, to making sure that A, the resources are thought about um, in a way that's fair and equitable, but also considers these recommendations and they should be institutionalized. We shouldn't have to reconvene such a group every time there's an emergency pandemic. Uh, and that such a response team could actually help decide on how to distribute um, valuable personal protective equipment or a vaccine plan or other limited resources uh, in, in a crisis like this. Uh, we shouldn't be seeing further uh, inequities, uh, racial inequities as a result of, a, result of um, a public health crisis. Um, in fact, and then uh, of course, as it goes without saying, lastly, we need to be very clear about how businesses, communities, and schools should stage reopenings. Uh, and you know, again, it has been a very piecemeal localized response with very little federal level coordination. And what resulted from that was a lot of confusion uh, and a lot of uh, la uh, sort of uh, uh, less trust uh, in those who were there to, to communicate uh, and make recommendations going forward. Um, and then lastly, at the local level, uh, we actually have seen public health leadership uh, threatened um, with, uh, you, know, you know, public health prides itself, public health officials pride themselves by doing their work behind the scenes. And we, when we do our work well, uh, you don't even know what's happening. You don't even know we're there. 
Uh, and then it's in the time when we shed the light on a breakdown uh, uh, in response that we do see where we, uh, we, we do see the people behind the scenes. Uh, and at one point in a matter of, I think it was between April and uh, June, there were about 28 senior public health officials at Lukmar who resigned out of uh, burnout and uh, threats because people simply just didn't want to uh, uh, follow the recommendations uh, put forth. Um, and uh, again, I think the federal, this current administration didn't help appease uh, those uh, feelings in the community. And so I would hope that, uh, you know, health is mostly a local, um, a local practice where the federal government sets forth policies and, and recommendations and supports it with funding. And I would urge uh, whoever takes office next, uh, this fall, uh, you know, take this seriously. Uh, and then we learn from learning from other countries. We should uh, continue to partner with uh, scientific leadership uh, in other countries. Uh, a pandemic doesn't know borders. Uh, yet we saw this administration uh, with uh, take the, our, the U.S. Uh, designees out of the World Health Organization. Uh, and I'm not saying the World Health Organization has all the answers, but how are we then to coordinate uh, our response? Um, to a crisis that goes across, you know, country borders. Uh, and so whoever the next president is, you know, also needs to have, be that dignitary and be that um, leader uh, to help us partner better with, um, you know, our, our international partners. So I, I, my intent was to sort of bring up, not an exhaustive list of, of recommendations, but strong considerations for both you uh, in the audience who are considering who to vote for in the next election, uh, but also uh, uh, lift up some of the regulations that are needing to be lifted up from our public health community. And in summary, it is we still need federal leadership. It's imperative to coordinate a robust response, uh, but that should then bring scientific leadership up front, right, and, and allow uh, and some accountability, of course, but not um, um, a crisis where you have scientific leaders question, uh, worried about what's going to happen to their job if they make a scientific recommendation. Um, I want to say that the SARS-CoV-2, the, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, you know, isn't a red or blue thing. It's actually a black and brown and communities of color thing. And keep that in mind. Um, of course, I'm not naive to think that there aren't politics involved in health, um, but I want these guidelines and principles to help guide uh, you know, whoever it is that is uh, in charge of deploying resources and appointing these leaders at our, our governmental levers, levels. And then lastly, we have been, you know, quote unquote, defunding our public health infrastructure for decades. Uh, and so I hope that it, this, uh, we have seen how closely tied we are to a strong public health uh, infrastructure that detects and prevents and controls uh, health threats like such as this one and others. Uh, and so it's a smart investment to me to, to argue for a, 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 a strengthened federal and local public health system um, that we know, um, you know it pays for itself um, and which we're going to need in the long term. That Thank you very thing. much, uh, David. That was uh, a really interesting uh, presentation about our future as well as the past. Um, I see that we have about 15 questions um, and um, the hour is getting late, but I want to get to those questions. But before I get to those questions, I feel compelled to say a few words myself and maybe exercise the right of the chair uh, to make some comments to the viewers, uh, the enrolled students and members of the public from a political point of view. Normally, uh, I would not be uh, a strong advocate for the political point of view uh, unless I thought it would illuminate some of the comments uh, that were made uh, in the four presentations um, that we heard. 
And I do want to thank all four speakers for their superb presentations. This is a provocative subject. It is, uh, as one of the speakers pointed out, a matter of life and death. And therefore, we need to be as careful, thoughtful, and comprehensive in our thinking. And I want to make two points. One that harkens back to last week's uh, presentations on the Electoral College. One of the major messages of the two speakers is the split between the responsibility of the federal government and its chief executive and the state governments going all the way back to the framers in the Constitution uh, and uh, present uh, to this day. No matter what the president thinks, no president can make policy regarding education. It is a wonderful example of the split responsibilities between the federal national government and state and local governments. The federal government only contributes about 10% of the total budget that is spent from K to 12. What happens in education is not a product of what happens in Washington. And we have a constitutional amendment that is very important to remember. And that is what is not left to the president, the national government, remains in the hands of the states and the people. A number of speakers talked about federal responsibility. It may well be that health is not uh, an issue that the president or the federal government, the Congress, can effectively deal with. And this goes to why we have this federal structure. And we heard last week that we have this federal structure because the framers were fearful of a strong national government. The structure of our government is not for efficiency. It is not for someone in Washington to utter a statement and all 51 jurisdictions to follow. I read in the paper yesterday, the Minister of Education in France was deciding whether to open the schools or to close the schools. We do not have a unitary government like France does. The president of France, the minister of education can make statements and make policy that all aspects of the country need to follow. That is not true in this country. And one of the reasons why is because of the supreme value of individual freedom. The framers were more concerned about tyranny than they were in effective government. And for the last 244 years, that DNA is built into our political system. Individual freedom and being anti-state is, has always been a characteristic of American political beliefs and American political system. The sign that I think Laura held up that said, my body, my choice, is more American than what David was recommending with regard to central government action with regard to public health threats. Is this a problem during a pandemic? I think it is. Would I want to be in a central government during a pandemic rather than a split government like ours? I think the answer is yes. But we are stuck with the government that we have. 
and we are stuck with the political beliefs that we have. And when Professor Yu pointed out the differences in nations, I found it revealing that her, her examples were the Philippines, South Korea, and I think Japan. One of the things we know about Asian society and Asian political systems is they do not have the tradition of individual freedom. They do not, in fact, they have the opposite. They feel comfortable in collective action and in collective decision making. That's not the American way. If we're going to make the kinds of changes that we need to make with regard to future pandemics, we are going to have to change political values. We are going to have to change political institutions. But as it stands now, the, the, the way to respond to this pandemic had to be what some people in the, in the speakers use the word confusion. I might want to use the word diversity. And it was the public who doesn't understand the federal structure that got confused between governors giving different policy recommendations from other governors. That is not confusion. That is the federal system and the diversity between Montana and Alaska and Utah and New York and California. And one size is not going to fit all. And that was always an advantage for the federal structure, that the differences between the states could be recognized in differential policy. I am not challenging the existence of confusion. What I am challenging is whether it was right. We cover the president in the media so much that the average person thinks the president is the government and we don't cover the governors and the local decision makers and most Americans don't even know their local decision makers and their state officials and even their governors. And we have low participation for the president elections. We have even much lower participation for state governments. So what I would say is, um, if I wanted to be uh, uh, critical of the speakers from this point of view, and I don't, I would just say, you need to take into consideration the political element and the political values of this society. We are not like a, a unitary centralized government. Maybe we need to be. I might argue that we do need to be, certainly during a pandemic, but it's going to require a persuasive effort to make the changes in our thinking, values, and institution to respond according to the requirements of a pandemic. So let me get to the questions. And if we need to stay a little over, I hope the speakers will uh, uh, abide by that and we'll be able to answer uh, uh, as many questions as we can. Um, Actually, the first question is a, a methodological question about the recordings, and I should have brought that up. Last week, I didn't know this, but this week I can report happily that we have made arrangements to have the recordings available for members of the public in addition to the enrolled students, and it's a relatively simple link yeah, it, it really is um, a connect sfsu.edu slash the presidential election, all one word. And we hope to have all of the recordings on this link for um, members of the public to access the recordings. So thank you for that question. 
uh, and reminding me of that important development. The, um, uh, I guess this is for you, Laura. The questioner doesn't understand the relevance of George Floyd with COVID-19. Sure, and thank you for that, Joel. I think that was really helpful um, to understand. I have some, some thoughts about that. Uh, in terms of, it may be Arnie's question, Arnie PA, um, there's a group of questions there, but um, the connection is really a question about how uh, expertise is, um, is used and how to think about the politics of knowledge and to think about uh, the concept of structural gaslighting. Um, the issue, I think, I've, as I already indicated, it is an issue of how we think about what we know, what we don't know, how we trust information, how we can be um, a participant in knowledge, understanding that knowledge can be political, knowledge can be politicized. Um, so it is an example to bring us to a conceptual argument that I am making that I think is important for thinking about COVID-19 and, and presidential politics. Okay, thank you. Um, let me go. This is a question about the FDA. How can we trust the FDA when they've shown their manipulation by giving emergency use authorization for hydrochloroquine and convalescent plasma on flimsy evidence and without controlled studies? How can we have trust in a public health agency if some of their decisions look untrustworthy. Anyone want to take that? I'll, I'll just say that that's, a, um, that's another exhibit, if you will, another piece of evidence how um, we've had uh, a, a crisis really of, of you know, scientific leadership that is certainly um, you know, laid in with some politics. I mean, let's not pretend that doesn't exist. Um, and so um, I think the, the larger point, I think um, in that question I would answer to is to hold our elected officials accountable in such a way. Like those FTA, I don't look at the FDA as much, but and that's a political appointee, you know, as part of the, uh, you know, as part of the cabinet really of, of the president, right? And so the person we elect at that level gets to choose these people and set this sort of precedent for that. And usually that's not an issue, um, but it just so happens to be that particularly in this administration, um, there has been an, uh, you know, an, you know, an obscenity of, 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 of that overkill of politics into science. I mean, certainly when I worked in the federal government, there were things we couldn't certain say or touch. We couldn't talk about firearms research and uh, we had to sort of stress abstinence only you know, sex, health, education for the, for, for a little bit, right? Um, and so these things are not going to go away by electing a new person per se. But I think it's what you said to uh, uh, Joel about um, you know making explicit what it is the values we hold, right, for the people we elect, right, and sort of demanding that even in the even in the election debates, I don't which we haven't had any um, really at a time soon, but really demanding sort of these values about transparency and um, you know, values in science and equity. Like those are really important attributes, I think, in an executive leadership uh, at the presidential level, because they trickle down into those very agencies that make these policies and decisions. Uh, and so we have to restore the trust to be honest. The answer to the question is we have a long, we have a lot of work to do before can, people will restore, can even have that trust again. Let me try to summarize what I think is um, uh, a theme in, in more than one question. You all come from a scientific discipline. What happens when there are differences and conflicts within the scientific discipline? And, and how does the lay person try to decide 
between which member of the field uh, they should support. Uh, and I'm thinking of a colleague not very far from here uh, at Stanford, who has now been um, uh, can moved into a part of the expertise at the White House, who differs very strongly with other members uh, of the expert plan. And how is a layperson to decide which expert they should trust? Well, I was going to add a little bit to what David said, okay. and maybe I can just try to give some, you know, thought of, uh, to this. Um, so I, I think that, you know, to the question of the student or the participant, I think one of the things that you could do or we all need to do is to become, as Laura Mamo suggested earlier, to become active and critical consumers of information. Uh, and to look at different perspectives from different scientists and to look at the details uh, of the science. Uh, and we will have US-based science, but there is science being produced all over the world. And I think that uh, in epidemiology, at least, uh, we know that if we see the same finding with different populations in different time points, then that adds credibility to what we are actually seeing. Uh, and so I think that that's one way to, to think about it. Okay. Anyone uh, of the remaining speakers want to comment on that or we can move on. I'll just, I'll just add that it's, that's why it's important. I mean, the scientific process usually is a, a slow one for that reason, right? Because we have to have review of each other's work and, 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 and checks and balances. And it's, that's, you know, this, the time frame by which we demand, we're demanding answers from science is, 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 is tough because there's a, there's, a, there's a process for that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's not perfect by any means. Uh, and we saw lots of scientific um, publications being sort of pushed through that peer review process um, in the past few months because of this demand. Uh, and so, um, you know, in a perfect world, sure, we'd have the time, but I, I also see how, you know, there, these things are, at, these, pol these politics are at play. Um, and, and so um, I think the idea I had behind a, a, a panel with diverse sets of scientific knowledge and expertise was sort of answering to this point. And as we need to have these various uh, credible experts at the table uh, who may, uh, who are available and supported to do their work. Okay, um, let's go to one more question. Um, let's see if I can get a general question. Um, uh, the, someone asked about the address of the recordings and um, I didn't give the exact punctuation. It's connect dot sfsu dot edu backslash the presidential election. So thank you for that. Um, the, this question, and maybe this is a good way, um, is the word blame appropriate regarding um, uh, a pandemic? The question asked, if the central government has no authority over what is happening in the states, health or education wise, how can the presidential administration be solely blamed for it? And I, I, I would think that maybe the word solely needs to be underlined. If one wanted to be critical here in California, one could say Governor Newsom's uh, uh, advice and recommendations was leading the pack of governors. He closed down facilities earlier than almost any other state. And yet the criticism might be made that we still had a second surge despite the, the leadership in March and April and the worst in case studies and in deaths was in July. And so maybe the issue is 
and a number of the speakers uh, mentioned this, the politicization of the virus and, and trying to lay blame on either one administration or another may not be the best way to go forward. And what we need to do is to recognize that this was a novel event, a novel virus that even the scientists didn't recognize and that we were learning at the beginning. Part of the anti-mask position was taken by Dr. Fauci himself earlier on where he didn't think um, masks were necessary. And then of course he changed. Changing does not necessarily mean something pernicious. It means learning is going on. And I think politicians are so fearful of changing positions because they are susceptible to being accused of being manipulated or trying to manipulate the public. We need to respect learning and learning might be in March, I thought one way and in April, I thought another. What would the speakers say about that? Um, I think it's a it's a challenging question. Um, you know, I did this presidential uh, panel four years ago. I was invited by Dr. Cassiola. Four years ago, we had two uh, people running who had not been president. We looked at their platforms and we spoke about it. In this case, we have the evidence of a sitting president. We have four years. We have a year at which six months or more has been the pandemic. We can see how the federal government and the followers, it's not just the position and the president, but we have a unique situation of a president and his followers. And they are operating in ways that, I mean, somebody wrote the bully pulpit in the comments. But that we have also a media that is, that is consolidated. So we don't get local news like we used to get. I mean, the federal power and the power of this particular administration and followers is pretty strong. Um, and we have the evidence. So while this panel might sound a little bit different than, than in the past where you just look at two people running, it's, we have evidence and uh, what scientists do is they look at a lot of evidence and they look to see what we see patterns, what saturates, you know, how do we, how are things credible? You see them over and over again. You know, you look at who's from whose voice and through what processes that knowledge is coming about. And yes, you debate and you have lots of different positions. Um, and we're in a unique place. It's not just about different positions, um, but it really is about questioning experts and expertise. Um, anyway, I, I'm sorry, I lost track of the question, but I just I wanted think, to say this Laura, is a you've, made, you've made a, a truly a telling point, and I, I do want to underscore it by drawing the contrast between 2016 and, and 2020. And I think you use the word that I think as, as scholars, and certainly my role uh, as a political philosopher, this is one of the sacred words. And I know for scientists, it's also equally sacred. And, and that is the word evidence. And, and we need to make decisions on evidence. And we need to look at the evidence as you pointed out. And I think you are really correct in pointing out that Donald Trump is in a different position in 2020 of, than he was in 2016. And you are correct to point out that we have almost four years of policy making, four years of making decisions that affect public health and that respond, responded over a six month period uh, to the pandemic. 
So I, I do think that's a good point to end on. I don't want to keep people uh, beyond uh, uh, what we can um, uh, do. Um, and that we need to hopefully educate ourselves and use the word um, evidence and learning and listening to each other and dialogue, dialoguing with people who disagree with us and analyzing their evidence and have them analyze our evidence. And hopefully that is the way the rational process will produce better outcomes. And I certainly think uh, that that is the goal that can unify everyone, that everyone wants a better outcome. And when we deal with public health, uh, as one of the speakers pointed out, we want less hospitalizations and fewer deaths and, and, and fewer cases. And uh, when you have the goal um, unified, then you can discuss means in a um, careful, rigorous manner, and I dare say in a rigorous scientific manner. So with that, let me thank everyone who uh, stayed with us beyond our time. And especially, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Emma, Laura, Grace, and David for a fascinating uh, set of presentations about a topic that is happening right now. Uh, you all didn't have the benefit of um, looking back on a past event, uh, but need to, needed to bring order to an event that's literally changing every day. And so I want to express my deepest thanks to all four panelists and, um, and for the viewers for staying uh, with us. And next week, we will move to what might seem uh, a placid subject uh, compared to this one, even though in most years, uh, it would have been among the most um, controversial. And that is the economy, uh, which we haven't mentioned here. But one slide, uh, and I forget the speaker, did talk about a balance between public health and uh, maintaining the economy. And this turns out to be perhaps uh, an impossible task. Uh, and it might be something we can raise next week with our three economists. So with that, let me invite everyone back for next week and to thank the speakers again. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Have a good night.